everyone. Um, so, wait, oh, this is not the beginning. Sorry. As you can see, there are 70 slides here. Cool. Everyone looks really good today. Uh, the crowd looks really diverse. And I wonder how the aggregate web sort of looks at everyone, how it identifies you through your like various forms that you filled out. So how does it see you online? And, um, and I suppose if you want to go by one data point, <laughs> it's probably like the Twitter social justice warrior list, which means Mark Andreessen should have blocked you. And if he doesn't, he doesn't really know you guys. So, um, so I want to also give an update that uh, uh, originally the, the talk was about surveillance as well. So it was about surveying versus surveillance. And I want to go back to uh, something Morgan said, which is bringing back the complexity of humanity back onto the web. And uh, I sort of dropped the whole surveillance part of it, um, only because I wanted this to be about utopian speculations rather than dystopia. And also for having like reasons of being undocumented in the US during a time of like xenophobia. Um, I've been surveilled, I know what that's like, and I think there are bigger crises than surveillance right now, which is partly like uh, acknowledging identity. So um, there won't be any talk of surveillance, and I don't think I used the word white in any of the slides, so check me on that. All right, before we start this presentation, though, if you could just fill out this onboarding form, just pick one or the other. Um, everyone's cool. If, if you can't pick one, like, sorry, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I think of every other form you filled out, and if there's any... Like, what if any useful data that, like, have you put into those forms? We fill out tons of forms, and it's just like name, age, you know, address, male, female. It's pretty binary. And so, let's take my identity for example. Um, you put it into this amazingly designed form, stored in binary, so we can retrieve, analyze, and exchange it. And what do we get? You put all, you know, this quintillion bytes of data, and you get, whoa, oh, this, this is me. 30s, Asian male, uh, maybe some income data, profession, marital status. And that's sort of the volunteered information. And there's also all this user-generated data um, where I check in like what I like, voluntary and voluntary data that's collected. And um, there's some person that all this data correlates to. And I sort of think when you think of epidemiology, um, it's like some epidemic occurs and there's a spike in an event, but we know very little about the people that it's happening to. So it's like, well, oh, cool, we have all this data, but uh, what does that correlate to? Is there like a genetic condition here, or is there like some aspect of their personality that's caused this rise in diabetes? Who knows? But back to the point is like, really, is that me? I'm like three points of data. Um, I don't think so. I'm, this is who I am. I'm Young Rama on Twitter. I'm a writer, designer, and entrepreneur. Um, I'm South Indian. I'm Tamil, to be precise, which is uh, one of the only classical languages that's still in use today. There's another Tamilian here. Any other designers in the room? A couple of designers, cool. Um, and yeah, I'm also a late night tweeter, so uh, <laughs> that's, that's me. Um, but I think, you know, we, we collect all this data and we say it's we need to keep it simple, fast, or secure, you know, and that's why, that's why we only collect a little bit of data about people. Or maybe uh, we mostly just don't care about people. We don't care about our users, so it's like, uh, let's, or maybe it's that most of our forms were designed for like transactions or advertising or logins. So it's like a very um, flat, like not very in informative sort of data collection about users. And you sort of, in this rather crude binary sampling, you sort of lose a lot of rich metadata about people. You lose, you know, you lose stuff about the interests, the depth of them, and their specifics about them. Again, you kind of just have, are you male or female? Is that, you know, is that it? Uh, and then there's, you know, I think OkCupid okay kind of does something a bit better. Uh, you know, there's actually a checkbox for Indian there. It's a step up from Asian and. There's also sapiosexual. That was like a shout out to Sean from Tinder, you know. Uh, and like they have other sorts of uh, gender options and relationship types and stuff like that. But 
by and large, I think when you sample people's identity in a really like crude way, you end up with something like this. Uh, we lose a lot of information about people, um, and we have to guess or resort to bias. So, like, a 30 AM is like I'm 30s Asian male. That's that's me. Could be anyone, sort of. Um, and because of that, you strip a person of context, and it's just a guessing game, and you sort of end up with some really strong biases, propagating from offline to online. So, also related to OkCupid, okay this is how people tend to quick match based on like whether they're male, female, or like Asian, Latino, black. So there's a lot of like, you know, instant judgments and biases and all that. But uh, there's another fact, I'm just throwing this in there, that people tend to find each other more attractive after they've spent time together. So it's sort of this weird thing. It's like, well, I don't know, swipe left, swipe right, whatever, sapiosexual, blah, blah. Uh, and you know, and there's, and there's understandably like there's good reason to want to not share personal information. Like as you talked about, trust and safety is a concern, and uh, we're just becoming aware of that how dangerous it is online. But I sort of think the only way out of hell is through it. So we can't just guess who our users are or imagine their behaviors. Um, if we do that, we'll just start to imagine they act as if. They act as though they're like, sorry, if we imagine who our users are, we just tend to pour, uh, project ourselves onto them, right? As designers, especially. Well, like, oh, I don't really know anything about them, but I, I'm sure they like whatever I like. So that's, let's just put that in there. Um, and that's a problem because, uh, well, besides not having data about them, we're also sort of evolutionarily hardwired even as infants, to recognize age and gender. Um, race is a bit different. But I think by and large, those naturally evolved judgment systems are sort of outdated for our modern social economy. So some, some of the like, human firmware about how we uh, recognize and sort of, uh, I guess, identify people that, that are in an in-group and all is sort of outdated. Um, and so what happens when this sort of pattern recognition meets low sampling, I think um, we just make really bad assumptions and we overlook the natural variance in the world um, and we discount people's inherent value in favor of like whatever the dominant group is doing. Cool. So how's everyone doing so far? I'm just sort of, this is all stream of consciousness. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how I got to like 70 slides, uh, but... <laughs> Anyway, so because, of, because people and their identities are not represented in any data format, we just sort of disregard them. We make uninformed judgments, we gaslight them when issues arise. And we do that offline as well. And so we're in a sense excluding people from meaningful conversations and research. Um, instead, you know, we build out these really impressive organizations, we've got all these employee and user metrics that drive performance towards impressive results. And because, you know, we live in this post-racial secular society and all that fluff. And then what happens? Erica Baker passes around a spreadsheet and lights it on fire because she collects meaningful sal salary data. And, you know, and then when the data comes out, it's like, oh, snap. Uh, I'm fourth on that list, I guess, somewhere between white female and black female as of 2012. Um, so it's sort of like this, like, what's up with that? Why did, like, why did we not collect data sooner? And thanks for that, Erica. Um, and I think part of this is sort of rooted in uh, philosophy. It's sort of rooted in Western secularism. And Western secularism is sort of different in that it sort of, it seeks to bar expressions of religious diversity. Think of like the hijab in Paris and whatever the fuck's going on with Republican politics right now. Um, <laughs> versus, you know, according to Amartya Sen, like Eastern secularism, which says like, if you offer an identity for one group, you have to offer it for everyone. So what happens, you have 200 national languages in India, and like there's a holiday every week. That's just, that's just it. Because if you have a holiday for the Christians, and you have got to, you got to allow a holiday for someone else. And so, um, imagine personal data in the future is far more inclusive. So it's not Western secularism of like, no, 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 we just don't want any data because we're post-racial and all that. It's just like, no, 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 we just have everyone's data in here. 
Or we could just settle for that toggle switch. Um, well, I think that's kind of crappy. <laughs> and we're all really complex individuals here with like malleable identities and amalgams of qualities, beliefs, expressions. Um, and so I think of census, like census data. I'm Canadian. Uh, more shout outs to the Canadians, a lot of Canadians in the Bay Area. Uh, and this is about John Talon, who sort of, I think they say he ran the first census. And it's, you know, he just sort of went around to villages and asked people like what they wanted, who they were. And Canada and Estonia rank as two countries that have the highest like uh, family census. It's kind of, I think it's like law in Canada that you have to fill out the census thing. It's like, what are you gonna do if I don't? And yeah, and the long form is back, right? Ted Harp, Stephen Harper, sorry. I haven't lived in Canada in a while. Uh, <laughs> when he came into power, he stripped, he said, we don't, we don't want to do long form census anymore. We've done it for, what, 40, I don't know, hundreds of years, whatever, and he's like, no, 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 we don't think we need that data. I'm just gonna run this government how I want to. And then, you know, Trudeau uh, brought it back. So, how can we like think about long form identity data so we can sort of gather more insight and foster utopian change? Because like there are these situations that happen where we don't have any data and we can't like uh, solve issues before they happen, right? So uh, we need to think about how data might be used beyond just transactions, advertising and logins towards like trust and safety and like visibility for the least visible. And so that recent incident with Airbnb, you know, uncovering some rather systemic issues with hosts and guests, um, could that have been avoided if there was better like data built into the onboarding? I'm, I'm not sure I'm asking, that's a question. Anyone here work at Airbnb? I think there's a couple, right? Hey. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, so. Yeah, so, you know, with better identification, can we sort of understand these uh, epidemics before they sort of happen, before they spiral into like PR nightmares and a bunch of emotional damage for people? It's, you know, it's pretty triggering. And so I think in all of these things, I tend to side with like, Douglas Rushkoff and Astra Taylor in believing that the internet was sort of built on top of a really flawed operating system, which was, you know, capitalism and extractive capitalism at that, and that unchecked, Online spaces tend to mimic offline spaces because we're human. Um, and I'll just read a bit of that quote. It's the web is hailed for its openness and that's where the confusion begins because open is in no means equal. And while the internet may create space for many voices, it also reflects and often amplifies real world inequalities in striking ways. And so, and so there's also, so we've got this thing of what do we do with the people online now, and there's also what about the next one billion people coming online? You know, especially in India and Asia. Um, you know, are we just going to subject them to our sort of data standards of personal identity, like male, female, white, non-white, cool, all of you guys get in that group, it's, it's chill. Um, so how can we support them, or are we just gonna continue with these ethnocentricisms? Uh, because I think, um, I think in the pre-internet world, you know, many folks were subjugated to like, uh, to the fringes because the identity didn't sort of fall into the, into the sort of main group. You know, and then you had suffrage, emancipation, uh, post-colonialism, and in modernity we sort of got to spread our arms out on the internet while it was still new and fresh, and today I think we're still in this sort of virtual equality um, for a lot of, uh, minorities and underrepresented groups. Oh, there's one badly designed slide. Here it is. Uh, so when I think about virtual equality, I think about Urbishi Vade's book, Virtual Equality, you know, uh, and I think we so, and I sort of map a lot of my ideas to her like, her like tiers of humanity. And I think there are three tiers. First you have to acknowledge people or a group, then you have to accept them, and then you, then you actually, at some point, we'll get to affirming these groups, right? Like Black Twitter, let's shout out for that. Like, we'll get there, and we're sort of like going back and forth between all these three things, but I think data especially comes into like, let's just acknowledge that these groups exist online, and that they have these like really uh, diverse identities, and 
yeah, let's just get with acknowledge. I think that was supposed to mean something. Um, but we can, I think we can't get to acceptance and affirmation but, like without acknowledging, uh, acknowledging the presence. Um, because otherwise, again, we're back to this dominant binary, male, female, white, non-white, gay, straight, uh, rich, poor, able, disabled. So <laughs> let's bring data to sort of give us tools to properly survey uh, people are along a wider axis of like gender, race, sexuality, ability, socioeconomics. Um, besides just like we know where you've been and what you shopped for last. Um, so, uh, because I think eventually we'll get to like affirming people and the true diversity and variation found around. Um, and so this is really about challenging that people should conform to a form. It's a challenge pessimism of will on the subject of identification data. It challenges that our data works today because it's collected and it works and it's good enough, why should I care? It challenges the notion that um, things have always been this way and people have always been marginalized or put to the fringes. We can't really account for everyone. It challenges the idea that it's too complicated to design and build systems that better represent the variance of people. And so, Slide 44, we're getting there. Uh, <laughs> I put it into six conjectures, uh, kind of simple rules. Um, this is the overview. I think people have multiple and overlapping identities. Uh, I think omission of data is harmful. I think sampling rates will improve over time. I think people should still supervise their data. Um, data is good as it is wide, and I think useful identification is possible. So one, multiple and overlapping identities. Um, I take three-time immigrants like myself. We're often in a state of becoming. Uh, we're kind of never at home in our roots and never at home in new neighborhoods. So we kind of have this third culture. And I think most people actually have this sort of um, neuroplastic, malleable identity. I think we're always changing. Like, thank God I'm not the guy I was in college. That's, that'd be terrible. Um, so how do, we, how do we make identity robust? How do we allow it to change with us to incorporate wider aspects of ourself? Um, because we have neuroplastic brains um, and we have a lot of expressions and outlets. Um, and we're not all, you know, we did, we're not all like this monocrop that's gonna listen to Spotify's latest feed. Um, because heterogeneity thrives and you know, oh, I did use this word. Uh, so why do we insist that the internet is the domain of white men from the global north? It seems terribly archaic and a holdover from like an, you know, an old world. So I think we can, we're starting to acknowledge in design and engineering that the internet can represent plural, plural, ah, plurality. Uh, Facebook and Pinterest gender ID sort of move in that direction. Well, skipped ahead. Mm, okay, cool. It's gonna get a drink of water. So this one is that the emission of data is actually harmful. Um, and uh, Melinda Gates, I think, had just announced that there's $80 million going towards um, getting more data around girls around the world. And uh, she says that data just doesn't exist for a lot of problems we're trying to solve. And it misses women and girls entirely or undercounts and undervalues their social and economic contributions to the families and communities. So it, the emission of data can actually hamper our ability to advance a cause. And worse, it can simply distort what that community uh, experiences and sort of just reinforce our own stereotypes about them in, in its place. So, so such emissions reinforce that a lot of groups of people simply don't matter. But I think of Shivani Soraya's work on InVenture, where she's starting to use wider pools of data to provide loans to people that Wall Street wouldn't otherwise look at, um, based on like rich data correlations between who's in their network, who do they make phone calls to, where do they travel, like who are they as a person, it's sort of this wide data collection. Um, and there's some correlation between uh, the ability to pay back a loan and how many times they make a phone call to a couple of people. So, 
that was that point. Uh, this is sampling rates improve over time. I think the web is still young. Um, and just as sort of, uh, we went from like 8-bit audio and 8-bit gaming to higher fidelities, I, I sort of use that as an analogy that um, we can forecast that identity and behavioral sampling will improve over time to approximate the true diversity and variation found in life. So rather than this, you know, it's sort of uh, the expanse of what a thinking, feeling person is. And I think this is sort of uh, one of the things that I'd, I'd love to get into more if you want to talk about it, is that there could be this open web identity that's maybe blockchain that gives you, gives, gives you control over your personal data, but you really sort of, it's like open ID or something like that. You can just define what people have access to about like who you are as a person. And, um, and maybe that identity consortium could go from a small useful subset into like this ever expanding, you know, collection of the dimensions of humanity, like first gender and then evolve into sex and then properly catalog like what region you're from and then specific geographies and I don't know, just kind of create this open identity for a lot of people. Uh, and I think we should still supervise our data. So even as we sort of venture forward into offering up our data voluntarily, we should still be vigilant about involuntary use of our data. So like turning on uh, tracker blockings and uh, so they're not just kind of pulling data about you all the time. Um, so there's no reason I feel like you shouldn't use DuckDuckGo or EFF Privacy Badger at a minimum. Um, so data is as good as it is wide. I think this is sort of, um, we don't know what we don't know often. And so I think of this like uh, thing, uh, the story I heard in an economics class where the difference between surveyed unemployment and real unemployment has to do with often whether people had phones, could afford phones in their home. And so it's like, well, we called a bunch of people and this is what we found out the unemployment rate was. It's like, well, what about the people that didn't have phones? What, what happened to them? And so I think the lesson in trying to become aware of our blind spots, uh, I think of like Clue app and how, um, you know, and what they did for period tracking, which as a guy that grew up with all boys in a Catholic Indian family, like I didn't know what a period was until my first girlfriend. And, but that, that's no excuse like that we shouldn't be trying to collect better personal data about people. Um, and I think so the last one is that I think useful identification is possible. Um, I'm doing a product design fellowship right now and it's in the financial tech sector and I'll probably be looking for a job afterwards, so shout out there. Uh, <laughs> But you know, if, you, if you've ever worked in this sector, there's such arcane uses of personal data. It's like FICO scores are the worst and most opaque sort of form of data. And they just don't move. It's just like, okay, you've been put in this. Um, and it's some invisible calculation with little, little relevance about your ability to actually pay back a loan. And so what happens in this world of opaque financial data? You get loan sharks like predatory lenders and payday loans just blowing up and that's where we are today. But some companies are starting to um, take larger sort of collections of your data as actuarial proof that you can pay back a loan, you know, based on your networks and who you know. Um, so they're creating sort of these credit forecasting systems outside of FICO scores. And uh, this is just a screenshot of something I was working on, but it's the idea that if, if you like sampled your bank history and when you made payments, it actually will give you a good forecast of your ability to pay back X amount of dollars within a year, rather than this FICO score that just sort of came out of nowhere. And so I think, w again, personal data and forms, um, I think within organizations, we need to think about how we design better forms and like you start using the custom fields in Slack to sort of get, if you're gonna do it internally, like are there more fields that we can put in besides these really bare bones ones so we get a sense of what our organizations look like. So, you know, we can spot potential red flags before they happen. And yeah, and so survey, not surveil. I think of Estonia and Canada with their e-census. Um, 
and it's a pretty widespread sort of census in Estonia. It's all digital, and the government is continually working on anonymization and visualization of this e-census with the hopes that in the future the census itself is unnecessary. They're just passively collecting all this data from various like government agencies and you know, putting, giving, you know, giving the government of Estonia a really good insight into what their society is like. But as always, data is not tantamount to social change. Um, you know, we still have to do the hard work of it, but I still think we need to acknowledge it first and uncover that. And so countries and companies paving the way for improved census and better decision making based on data suggest a future where diversity and well-being is less a slogan and much more like a, of a science. And uh, so as Marshall McLuhan says in this poster outside, I just took a picture of it, we shape the tools and thereafter they shape us. And yeah, and that's, that's it. Thanks, guys. Thanks.